he he was appearing to be on more and more unable to do things for himself and i went to go see him another time and that's when i realized something would have to change whether he came to live with us or went into another facility something was going to have to change because he was not able to really think about his own care at that point my father wasn't easy as a father to communicate with he was very very difficult he knew it wasn't going to be easy my daughter knew it wasn't going to be easy she was um like 22 or 3 at the time uh, living with us uh, and uh, i knew it wasn't going to be easy but we knew it was right so that's how we that's how we got that's how we got here <laughs> So yeah, basically, we were everything for him. Now he got around, you know, he was able to get dressed. He had his mind. He did crossword puzzles. He had a room with the, his TV. You know, it was just like having another person in the home. He didn't require my care when he first came in. Um, and he would have been getting, approaching 90? Yeah, the- he would have been, well, actually, when he first, because he came in 2014, Teen, so um, more like eighty-eight. I think it was eighty-eight, maybe eighty-nine. Yeah. And then, yeah. And Sterling was retired, so you yeah. had just hit retirement. Right, right. We had just hit yeah. retirement. We were looking forward to doing the things that people who are retired do. And actually, you know, initially he didn't really. Th- there was not that much interference with that with him there. You know, he stayed with us for three years, and it was later in his that stay that, you know, the physical decline began to happen, where he was having a hard time getting from the bedroom to the pantry area, from the bedroom to the garage, uh, to get into the car. Um, the burden wasn't so much his physical presence, it was more his emotional presence. Um, Like I said earlier, he was not easy to get along with. So we, you know, we had that, but it was his relationship with my husband. Or if he says something sarcastic to my daughter and she became hurt, that was so, so difficult. Mm -hmm. So difficult. Um, Because it put me in a position of father versus husband. It was very hard. My father might walk out into the kitchen. Sterling would totally not see him or not acknowledge him. My father would notice, you know, and then he wouldn't acknowledge him. It was just a strange dynamic mm-hmm. that, um, that made it very, very difficult. What would you suggest to someone who's trying to make that decision? Should I say yes or no to my parent living with me what are the things that you think that you learned that would be items to consider um well you know maybe before i had the experience i might have said something about are you able to get along with that person but i now know that that's not necessarily a key component Hmm. Okay, because we didn't. Um, and I don't want to set him up as being someone who was mean. Uh, you met him. You, you noticed how charming he can be. He was, right. He was delightful in many, many ways. He was just very entrenched in his own way of being. You know, he didn't really consider whether or not your feeling got hurt kind of thing. But that, I don't know, would be a strong consideration for whether or not you have a parent come live with you. Is Do you have the resources? Um, and resources could be not just money, um, but space. Do you have space? Will this person have their own room? Will you be able to, to separate? Do you have space? Um, Time, money, space. 
oh, help. help. Yeah, so it's not so much whether or not you like this person or don't like this person, because sometimes doing the right thing isn't always the com most comfortable thing. Uh, but ultimately, it becomes the most comfortable thing because you know you've done the right thing. Does that make sense? Sure. But the resources do need to be considered. And if you don't have time or help or money or space, I would suggest you help your parent get those, get those, or at least as many as you could possibly get. Um, because it could be very, very difficult. It could be, it was already, even with those, having those resources, it was already a stressful situation. So um, I would, yeah, I would say that those would be more of what you look at. Right. I remember you saying, this is my father. I am not going there. I am not cleaning him up. I totally appreciated, respected what you were saying. Well, I ultimately did have to do it. So, so, so much for what I thought I wasn't going to do. He maybe didn't make the bathroom, you know. And I remember him being so, so embarrassed, you know, so, wow, you know. And that's the part that I saw more than I saw the mess. I, those kinds of things were not actually as repelling to me as I thought it would be. Um, and, and helping to, him to, to be okay with that. And then it wouldn't have, an accident like that wouldn't happen for weeks and weeks, you know? Uh, and then of course, gradually it became more and more where um, he would come out of his room and you know, he'd have a wet spot in the front of his pants. And I would be ready to take him with me to bring my daughter to work and, and have to tell him that he, he wasn't going to be able to come um, because, you know, there would be the odor as well. And um, that became difficult because he resisted in a lot of ways. Um, saying things like, uh, well, you know, that's, no, that's just, that's nothing, you know, I'll just go in and so he would go in the bathroom and try to wipe himself off and, you know, make a bigger wet spot. And it was just, you know, it could be a situation comedy, actually, when I think back on it. Of course, at that time, it was hard. It was, you know, this man who, who prided himself. In, in his grooming and, and that's, you know, not so much, he was always the one who would say, um, I don't need to take a shower, but once a week. So I don't mean he was like ultra, but he would get up, he had his routine, the shirt would be tucked in, he'd get a shirt, he'd put on his pants, he'd wear his shoes. He always got dressed, he, he was, you know, the, the shaving got done, the hair got done. So now here was a man that was slipping in some areas. He knew he was slipping in some areas and didn't even really have a lot of the energy that it takes to, to correct it. And I ended up having to spend, um, when he really started to decline in health, um, there was a point, as you know, where he didn't get out of bed. It was Easter Sunday, 2017. Easter Sunday, he got up out of bed, had dinner, his shirt was not tucked in. He had his shoes on that, that were the, the tongue of the shoe was slipping up. I don't even think he had socks on. And he came and he had dinner and he went back to bed and he didn't get back out of bed for months after that. Wow. And when that happened, I did have to become the one who changed him and changed the sheets and tried to get him to come back out of bed, but he just didn't. That was it. He just stopped. There was some lapse in, in what I would call understanding time. So he wouldn't realize that he had been in bed for two days. Mm -hmm. um, uh, he was still managing to get to the bathroom, but then there just became a point where that energy, the energy it took to do that wasn't something he, he just had anymore. So yeah, for, um, let's see, that was in April, April, the month of April, May, until you had that conversation with me to get help. 
Um, I was the caretaker. I was the main bathing, cleaning, cleaning the sheets, wiping him down, um, washing him in the most private, intimate areas. Um, and he would wave me away, stop it, you don't have to do that, you know, that kind of thing. And it was, it was that kind of daily, several times a day that happened, you know. Um, so yeah, you know, you think you're not going to do something and well, you do because you do it. Your time, your resource of time was diminishing and it became a bigger and bigger chunk of your life. You it, that's perfect. That's exactly what happened. So it became uh, much more a part of my life. And, uh, and I didn't realize how much I had told myself I would not do that. I would not do that. And yet here I was doing it. So not only was it um, this physical part of my life where I was actually in there doing the things, cooking, like you, you were saying, but it took up a lot of mental space as well. I don't want to do this. I don't have to, I don't want to, you know, but I didn't know how to, to get that other resource that helped. I didn't understand how to do that. I didn't know um, how to do that. My husband uh, wasn't going to do that. Um, my daughter helped as much as she could, but so I was, I was there. And I wasn't resentful with my husband because he was the one who said he should be here. He should be here. Um, he helped me in some respects, but he just wouldn't help me with him. <laughs> you know? um, yeah, so it, it, it took a mental, it took a mental toll. And I didn't realize that um, until later. Um, and we might be able to touch on that, but it, it, but you do what you have to do. Thankfully, you, and I know one other person said to me, Vanessa, you need to, to get hospice in, in the house. Because if I can just say something, I heard you saying you do what you have to do, but I think sometimes that becomes very blurry. You might think you have to, but maybe you don't. <laughs> That's it. I mean, you hit it right on the head. That's exactly right. I'm glad you mentioned that because that's exactly what I was thinking, that I had to do it. That, um, uh, first of all, I didn't even know he would qualify for hospice. I didn't have, I didn't understand what hospice was. That's number one. So I learned a lot about that. Um, having someone come into home um, it could be quite expensive. So yeah, I thought, I thought that there was no other recourse. And I'm so happy you said that. Because all that was, was a thought in my, my own mind that said, I have to, to do this. Good. Ultimately, you end up paying for that in, in a lot of ways. Because you're so all in, you lose a sense of your own life and um, are so into this person's needs that your own are forgotten and it kind of spirals down. Yeah, absolutely. And they're not even forgotten, Catherine. That's right. They're very much remembered. They're very much remembered what you're not doing. And that, so then it, it just goes like this. Well, I can't take a walk and I can't, you know what I'm saying? So you don't forget what you want to do. You just put, you keep pushing it. You know, you keep pushing it aside. So yeah, you're, you're absolutely right on. You, you, you know, and then, and then you do forget certain things like, boy, when was the last time I went to the nail salon? Or when was the last time I actually took a walk, a long walk, just, you know, because it was a beautiful day outside. And at the same time, you're probably trying to predict the future somewhat. And how much longer is this going to go on? And should I feel guilty because I really want things to maybe move a little faster now. I did. I don't know about other people, but I had a sense of, of guilt. I not only wanted them to move faster, I was ready for him to die. Right. And, um, um, you know, I, I know those thoughts were very clear. And I think they need to be said because 
we could really feel guilty about that. Mm -hmm. you know? And then we can make it try and, and sound really spiritual. Well, I really want him to die so that he doesn't suffer. No, I wanted him to die so that I could be done, you know? And, and, <laughs> so people who have been in a caregiver situation, I think completely understand. And I had cared for an elderly aunt in my home before she had passed. So I remember talking to you at that time and I said, Vanessa, during that time, I said, I am going to write a book. And the title is, I love you, now die. Yes. Yeah. And that's when we really cracked up. I mean, we just had, yeah. And then I said, it's like, I really, really love you, now die. You know? <laughs> and I said, well, if you don't write that book, I'm going to write that book. <laughs> I want to be here for you. I want to care for you, but I'm exhausted. So, like, let's get this over with. Yeah, let's just, I mean, inevitably, it's going to happen anyway. Can we just, like, cut to the chase? <laughs> you, know? you know, and so I think it's really important to say that because, right. um, like you said, you're, you're interviewing people. You know, you're working in, in that community, and it's a thought that happens and it might happen several times a day and um but it doesn't mean that you're going to stop caring and it doesn't mean that you're just going to turn the path but thankfully you know you suggested hospice and one other person another good friend of ours said the same thing to me it was like two two times now i'm hearing this and so i did finally drag myself to the doctor uh, and, and it was the easiest thing to do you know, Catherine, it was like this whole story, you know, this whole idea, because I didn't know anything about hospice. I mean, who knows about hospice until you need it? I mean, really. Okay. Um, I didn't know what was involved. I thought he had to be like, I don't know, it, it had to be a terminal illness that you actually knew. He just decided not to get out of bed. I don't know if he was terminally ill or not. And it was the easiest thing I could have ever done. She made a prescription. We had an appointment. They came to the house. The nurse came to the house. She did an assessment. She took a lot of questions. She called the doctor and boom. And the very next day, Catherine, the very next day, there's a delivery at my house. The medical bed shows up. The, uh, the all the diapers, you know, all the, <laughs> all the, all the all the cleansing supplies the very next day at my doorstep. Oh my God, this weight just sort of lifted. It didn't lift completely because I was still the main caretaker, but a nurse coming in once or twice a week made such a difference. Such a difference. Everybody wants a peaceful ending. Did you feel that it was peaceful? Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah, after when it's all said and done. Um, for the three years that he lived with us, I found a lot of, um, I found a lot of thoughts and, 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 and beliefs in my own mind about him. They surfaced because he was right there. Mm -hmm. That I may have had all my life, but because we traveled and he wasn't in, in, in front of me, I didn't have to deal with them. Um, and, um, I have a lot of tools at my, at my disposal, you know, um, someone who's been in this, in the personal development field for a long, long time. I was a practitioner. I worked with people who had, stress. I had a lot of tools at my disposal on how to deal with, with a lot of those thoughts. Um, I didn't do it perfectly, but I did it and I was very consistent and, I would find, for example, when I would have that very distressing thought, I can't talk to him. He doesn't know how to talk. I would find the times in my own life when it was hard to talk to me. So what I found in those three years was all the things that I didn't like about him, I found an aspect of that in me. And like I said, it didn't happen like beautifully and like with this wonderful sequence. It was two steps forward, three steps back, three steps forward, one back, that kind of thing. When he was, when he, like the last couple of weeks, 
um, before, I mean, when it was really obvious he was on the morphine at this point, he was, uh, you know, in and out of consciousness. I remember looking at him and watching him and I couldn't find anything. And I looked, I looked hard. I looked at him. I had the memories of the last three years. I had the memories of childhood. I had the memories of all the, everything. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't find one thing I didn't like about him any longer. That was that grace. You know, when we were talking about just before we started recording, graceful aging, gracefully, grace is that a realization that what you thought were some of the worst times in your life were not the worst times. It was a time to, to find something else, something resplendent in front of you. And so he passed while he was listening to jazz. Now, what I didn't mention was my father loved jazz. So I put on jazz on the TV. So that direct TV music thing channel, I put jazz on. So I just played all day. And uh, that night, um, I had been sitting in, in the wheelchair next to his bed and my back and my butt were hurting. And I said, oh, I just got to get up and stretch. And I went and sat in my family room and fell asleep and the air conditioning came on, woke me up. So then I went back in his room and I just stood there because the breathing had changed, the breathing had shifted. And I just stood there. And as I did, on the TV, was still going with the jazz music, a song came on by a man by the name of Johnny Hartman and my father could sing. And when he sang, he sounded just like this man, Johnny Hartman. So I turn back at my father and I say, of course, he's unconscious. He's not receiving this at, at a conscious level. It's Johnny Hartman. That, I mean, you sound just like him. And I'm talking to him. You sound just like him. Oh, my goodness. That must mean it's time for you to go. You've got to go now. You know, it's time for you to go. This is your song. You got to go. And it's okay. And when you get there, tell, you know, I was telling him to tell Lillian, sweet Lillian, hello, my mother, you know, all the people who passed before us to say goodbye, you know, to tell them hello for me. But you got to go. And I looked back down and he took a breath and just clamped his mouth shut. And I waited. I waited for it to open again. It never did. And I waited. And I went, he did go on a Johnny Hartman song. <laughs> it was, well, I mean, I still get goosebumps thinking about it. You know, when I looked down at him with no breath, I just, I didn't see any difference, not really, because everything he ever was in my world was still here. Was still here. It was. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. So yes, he died in peace with his jazz. Mm -hmm. I died in peace. Um, anything that I had thought about him, believed about him, that was unkind, died, fell away. I was left with peace. And although the time and the space and resources came back immediately, the, the thoughts about, you know, like waking up in the middle of the night, let me check on him, wasn't immediate. That wasn't immediate. That took, that took time before I realized, you know, I would, I would actually go by the room and look in and then, you know. Oh, you would think, okay, now that he's not here, the thoughts about caring for him would go away that immediately, but they didn't. And I don't think they do at, at, at first. I would still wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning with the thought to check on him until, you know, uh, the present moment would, would hit. And, um, or, um, uh, you take, you know, doing something that I would normally do with him. Sad. Um, I, I can't say that I wasn't sad um, because it was a finality 
but the sadness was just so much love. You, people get sad because they have that thought, oh, I'll, I'll never be able to cook for him again. I'll never be able to, to see him again, you know, physically. And I, when I looked at him with his last breath, um, I, I just, the realization was he was always imagined. In other words, it was always, there was a physical body, but the father, the, the person was always imagined. You know, so in other words, I could be in one room and I would think of him and the whole image of him would be there. You, you see, it's just, it's there. And it was always that way. It isn't just that way in death. It's that way in life. And um, we are always telling ourselves the story of the person. Um, and, and sadness is love. You know, every tear that fell was nothing more than love being expressed through tears. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I wouldn't change it. So, thank you so much. You're very welcome. For Thank you for joining in on this conversation. Oh. I really feel like the words that you've spoken can possibly be really helpful to someone else, possibly even during the time that they're dealing with this difficulty. So, oh, I hope so. I, I hope so. Um, everybody has their own path. Mm -hmm. But at the end, it's, it's okay. It's just always okay. <laughs> we, mm, thank you sweetie it was a pleasure being here with you I love what you do by the way good stuff <laughs>